I I mean I kind of I'm I'm a little bit unaware of what's happening because maybe because I'm so immersed in my uh, day-to-day routine which as you know as a musician these days is a long list of things I mean um, I remember when I started out in the 80s it was like 95% music and 5% uh, management and stuff and now I mean we as artists have to be composers we're instrumentalists we're we're kick-ass performers, all that stuff that we used to be. But now we also have to be video editors, uh, sound technicians. We have to be roadies. We have to be our own tour manager. We have to be our own agent. We have to be our own um, manager. Um, we have Friends to be social well media, <laughs> social media uh, managers, PR people. Uh, we got to be uh, YouTubers. We've got to understand how Spotify algorithms work. I mean, it's just the endless, endless list of things that we have to do as artists today that is enough to make a, a person uh, dizzy. I mean, forget about this thing called what do they call it? Work-life balance. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think that uh, that just does not exist if you're a musician, because being a musician these days is like an extreme sport. So, so, um, so I might be a little bit out of the loop. Maybe my attention span is also shorter too. You know, when I go on Instagram or I, you know, try to find new music to listen to on Spotify, I'll say, oh, God, and then I get distracted because I've got to answer an email. You know, so it's tough. <laughs> it's tough these days. It's an interesting point. I, I really enjoy your uh, it just this Instagram there. These little shots that you put up or reels, mm-hmm. whatever they're calling them now on Instagram. Yeah, you can tell I'm out of date already. Right? <laughs> you've been changing it before. I was off it for a little. But these are you putting up these great little shots about um, set lists and uh, you know and all sorts of. Tell us a little bit about that because I enjoy your little shorts. Well. That didn't sound right. I meant it. Uh, yeah, like no, no, video. no. That's what they're called. Yeah, shorts. You got to get the lingo. Shorts on YouTube <laughs> and reels on Instagram. Yeah. Um, during the pandemic, I I kind of lost my momentum in terms of uh, touring, and um, I thought, and I, you know, like the whole Instagram thing, it can be very self-centered. Like, listen to me, look at me. Uh, here's a new photo of me. Um, I thought, why don't I change that and be useful to people? <laughs> So I thought, you know, because I've been doing this so long, I thought maybe I could share some of the things that I've learned the hard way, you know, in the music business. And so I I made a whole um, series called Gig Advice, and it's really designed to give one minute tips for especially musicians and singers that are starting out and they want a gig. and, and, And I basically teach them everything they don't learn in music school. So, because I've seen this so many times. I mean, I teach and and I have incredible vocalists that come to me for classes. And I was like, I don't need to teach you how to sing, but you have to learn how to run a rehearsal, rehearsal. And, you know, you've got to understand uh, chord changes and how a lead sheet works. And you have to understand how to communicate with musicians and how to count in a tune. Um, You know, what do you do when you get to the venue? What do you do when you leave the venue? Uh, You know, what should you wear so that, you know, you're not trying to adjust your belt and your jewelry and everything else while you're performing. So <laughs> all these little details, little things that you learn on the road, you know. So I made this whole series called Gig Advice. And it's on YouTube. And I put these videos up on my Instagram, Nancy Ruth Music, um, every Tuesday. And then on Thursdays, I'm doing a different series, which is breaking down my composition and songwriting process. So again, like they're one minute tips. So it was a great one the other day, just about riffs. Right? Yeah, doing, yeah, like uh, creating riffs. You know, like was it the dominant you... fifth or the dominant seventh? Or <laughs> I forget what it was. But, well, there yeah. were a couple of different ones that I've done so far. And one was a riff in five four times. So how do you create mm-hmm. a riff in an odd time signature? You know, and that's really fun. I mean, I started by creating a bass line and then you know filling out the harmony. Um, there's another riff that I created that was inspired by the sound of a construction site. So sometimes you can hear sounds in your environment and turn those into musical ideas. So that was the concept for the riff that I'm working on for the next uh, five weeks. So that, that song is called Temporary Home. And it was yeah based on like 
bang and nails and a very kind of like aggressive dissonant sound with, you know, uh, yeah. So there was a sharp nine in the chord. I start with a harmonic idea and then break it down, syncopate it, um, arpeggiate it, and then create a riff in whatever time signature I think would be appropriate for the idea. And so, yeah, I'm having fun with those. They're actually a lot of work to do. But so I'm going to have to start to monetize That's this. That's the somehow. bit that people don't see, right? Yeah. Because there's a lot of thought behind it and preparation yeah, and presentation. A lot and of work, getting it you know, because right. I like to do things well, like my production quality. I like to keep it high. So when I do those reels, I, um, I record the sound separately. You know, I do I did the video on the iPhone and then I'm recording the sound on Logic and then I'll mix it and make it look and sound good. Um, so I'm thinking what I need to do <laughs> is create an online course out of all this stuff so that at least, you know, like I can get paid because the thing that I think most musicians are dealing with these days is how do we monetize all this stuff that we're doing? You know, like I just made this long list of stuff that we have to do to keep the ball rolling. And I've looked at the Patreon model, but I'm not entirely convinced that that's the way to go because, well, for one thing, people are so used to getting everything for free, right? And this so they're like, changed. okay, so Nancy's charging now, so I think I'll go somewhere else. I mean, <clears throat> although hopefully I'll have, you know, some enough value for, for people to sign up to whatever course I might create, but, um, and certainly to come out to shows because that will be something that I'll hopefully get back to next year but um how do we how do we monetize uh, all this work that we're putting into our social media you know it's like the, the social media giants are making so much money off of us and and we have become slaves that's got to stop i got to do something I totally agree. yeah what about the um, just as you're talking there about uh patreon and, and monetization and so on it's amazing that people sometimes forget that you know musicians have to eat as well it's almost like an afterthought you know yeah. like, hey can you can you guys come and play in my bar tomorrow night we'll give you some beer right you know or, or whatever it people might, have of no clue they have no clue and this is something that um i battle with because gigs pay the same now as they did 20 years ago <laughs> you know i mean i got paid more like 30 years ago that I'm getting paid now for gigs. I, I guess I started out kind of on a high, but mm -hmm. um, with the big bands I was singing with, but uh, it's, it's, it's not, I, w I think artists are starting to figure out that we've got to turn this thing around. It's, it's, it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. Definitely. It's one of those things where you'll find um, maybe people have been, taking gigs for less money or they just take whatever's going and then this kind of lows the market for everyone else, you know, so that's what it's become. Yeah. Well, that's definitely part of it too, because, um, well, just to tell you what it's like here on the, in the South of Spain, it's a really ugly scene. If you ask me in terms of gig gigs, like I just mean bar restaurant gigs, because the going thing now is singers or saxophone players playing with karaoke tracks, playing with backing tracks. And it's cheap and it's easy, it's portable, and people don't care, it seems like. So I also think that the audience doesn't have the criteria that they that they might. Now, probably in a city, you wouldn't get away with this. But here in this touristy area in the sun, this is a big thing, you know. So when I go out to do local gigs, I'm doing my elegant jazz thing, you know, or, or I play, you know, like Spanish music as well. I love playing boleros and bossa novas and, and um, my own stuff. But, you know, I'm a, a trained musician. I bring my piano, my gear, and some really amazing uh, instrumentalists come along. And I've had uh, agents come up to me and say, why don't you just go out with backing tracks? Like, are you kidding me I, I would never do that like i would never do that and i would just rather wash dishes or scoop ice cream but i will never go out and sing with backing tracks and <laughs> what the hell i didn't like I'd become an artist to do that like it just totally defeats the purpose but people get used to this kind of a thing and that's what frightens me is that even the physio physiological reaction to the bad sound systems that you hear like i don't know how people tolerate it if I was eating in a restaurant and I, and I heard some somebody playing, you know, singing Proud Mary with uh, karaoke tracks, I would like, I would run. <laughs> I would run. 
<laughs> but I don't know. People seem to like that stuff around here. It's horrible.